Well, with, with such a wonderful introduction, I'm not even sure I need to say anything more. I mean, I should just... <laughs> Does anyone have some Britney Spears CDs <laughs> lying around? Or... Ah, come on, it's the best. She's the best, man. So good evening. Um, I'm really happy to be here. It's uh, it's, it's it's very nice to to make it to NLI HTML5. Um, sausages. Sausages are, as you've understood, really important, and we are in the business of making them, and we actually want you to make sausages. And because of that, we're going to be talking about standards, because standards and sausages always go together. Why is there a mouse there? So standards, standards. I mean, initially, I'm a web developer. I only came into standards sort of by a long series of very bad mistakes. But the normal reaction when you ask a proper web, de web developer about standards is basically, no! <laughs> because they tend to be pretty bad. I mean, we can get things to work overall, but they, they're not, you know, they, they could use some improvement. And to be fair, not all web, web developers react this way. Some of them say, why? <laughs> but standards do matter. Do, can any one of you tell me what this is? Canva. No. I did. Sorry? I did. It, that's, that's actually a very good answer. It's the first time I get, I get something close to the truth, but it's not what I mean. Well, can you tell me what the, the proportions should like maybe? Rectangle. <laughs> nice one, <laughs> Bruce. It's A4. <laughs> yes, yes, thank you. This is a, well, actually it's a, NISO 216 piece of paper because <coughs> you can't tell that it's 21 by uh, 29.7. Um, the proportion is always square root of 2. <coughs> and this standard actually matters. It defines the size of paper, and this means that you can buy a printer that's going to work with this paper. You can buy a binder that's going to work with this printer. You can buy like those nice little plastic sleeve things and put the paper in it and know that it's going to fit. And well, most pens tend to inter interoperate pretty well with any kind of paper, but still, I mean, you, you can be sure that if you buy a pen, it's going to interoperate with ISO 216 paper, right? And knowing that this is ISO 216, if you ever meet someone who knows that what ISO 216 is, you can also know that you can probably interoperate with that person pretty well because that's fairly scarce knowledge. But <laughs> <laughs> overall, when you get outside of paper, that tends to pretty you know, work pretty well as a, as a standard, so long as you stay outside of the US where they have this like sort of US letter kind of weird thing. Standards tend to suck on the web, seriously. I mean, most of the stuff, as Bruce explained earlier, most of the cool stuff in standards actually came from things that were not standards to start with. So if all of the innovation comes from browser vendors or people starting things that become standards afterwards, what is really the point? Why, why do we really bother with it? So what I'm trying to do is, is I'm going to start to introduce you to standards and try to welcome you into the wonderful world of standards and try to convince you that there might just be some value to take some of your precious spare time to simply walk into the world of standards. Now, if you wanted to do that by yourself today, as things stand, it might be slightly difficult. For instance, the W3C is, you know, it's a nice organization, and I don't say that because they pay me money. I say that because before they paid me money, as a developer, I actually wanted to get involved with it because they always say nice things. But all the work in W3C is in public, great, wonderful the number of public mailing lists that are archived on the W3C website is 1,098 as of yesterday. So let's imagine you have this idea, hey, I'd love there to be like big red shiny buttons on the web. We can't do that right now, it's, it's complicated. You try to style buttons, they don't really work. You, you want them to extrude off the screen. I want a really nice red button. Which of those 1,098 mailing lists do I actually write an email to, assuming you've even found the archives in the first place. 
uh, it's, it's like a very long corridor full of open doors. They're open, but they're very dark. And who knows what happens there? Besides, working groups are sort of maybe slightly daunting. Some of them are very, very welcoming and nice. And most of the time, if you get to know the people, they're very friendly. But you join a mailing list, and immediately you're in the middle of a conversation. And you don't know what the conversation is, except that it's between like 500 people. And those 500 people have been talking to one another for the past 10 years, if they're the youngest ones, 20 years if they're the oldest ones. And they all know all sorts of weird contexts. So they all know what those weird signs on the walls mean. And you're just like one of these guys wandering in the room and going, hey, hey yeah, oh, OK, you're talking about that. That's interesting, fine. Um, but it's very hard to enter the conversation. You have to listen for like several months in a row on the mailing list before you can understand what's going on. It's very technical. And I don't mean technical in the sense that, as a developer, you might be used to. It's technical in the sense of what happens when you try to implement a weird behavior of a corner case of a corner case of a corner case of something in a standard and take into account like content all the way back to 89. And it can be a little bit daunting. Plus, there's sometimes problems of overhead. Like, Different standards organizations work in different manners, but they all have something called a process. And so initially, you might think innocently that you want to just contribute an idea. But that's just here. And the perfect web is there, and getting a standard is here. But in between the moment when you propose an idea and the moment when it gets actually to be usable on the web, you have to jump through all sorts of hoops. I don't know if this is a game that's popular in the Netherlands. Um, it doesn't exist in France, so I have no idea if, if, it's, if it's worldwide. But it, in, in English-speaking countries, at least, this is snakes and ladders. So basically, you roll the dice, and if you fall on the, on the square that has a snake, you slide down the snake. If you fall on, on the bottom of the ladder, you climb up the ladder. You can tell that this ladder is very useful, since it's the next step up anyway. Um, but basically, it can be very demoralizing when you start very, ex you know, very excited about an idea. You bring it to a working group, you, 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 you describe it, okay, people go, okay, it's a good idea, we'll create a group, okay, let's talk some more about your idea, okay, this is just like six months from the moment you had your idea. Uh, now you start having a draft about the standard, okay, you're still down here, it gets published, cool. Then you need another draft, and then another draft, and then another draft, and then another draft. Oh, and then you get to last call, which is the moment when a draft turns at the point where you say, hey, um, uh, people who have not been paying attention, could you now pay attention to the draft? And then people go, whoa, oh, that's weird. So you get comments, and then you go back here. <laughs> <laughs> and then you start again, and again. And eventually, you know, you plot your way along the, the process, which is, which is a, you know, the process exists for a reason. It's not because evil people have decided that creating technology needs to be slow. When Bruce earlier described, you know, what Hixie was saying about how you create a standard, there's a reason why this is this, is this long. And A, it's because it's, it's difficult um, to, to do a standard right, but also it's because you need to get implementers on board there's absolutely no point in having a piece of paper, a document on the web claiming to be a standard if browsers don't support it. That has no value. Also, the way in which we get a standard is by um, making it royalty free. Royalty free means that the people who are participating in the creation of the standard say that their patents do not apply to the standard, or at least they give a royalty free commitment to anyone using the standard. This is extremely illegal and technical and boring, but it also means that all of us can use the web without paying royalties on the content, and that's extremely important. Which is why you get all those silly steps that seem silly, but that give lawyers a chance to validate the fact that this is actually what the company is committed to. And at the end, you get technology that you can properly use. 
And of course, when you get to the end of the standard, you need to work on the, on the next version, which brings you back to here. So <coughs> this is not to paint a dark picture of standards. Overall, it works. I mean, we do get stuff that works at the end, but it's painful. And if you want to contribute yourself, just, you know, maybe you have an idea, maybe you have a problem with something, maybe you want to move things forward, it's kind of daunting to have to jump through all these hoops. Also, they're jerks. <laughs> and this guy's particularly the bad one. I mean, look at the this picture of robot, the sunglasses, and that. I mean, this, this, this is a serious jerk. I'm, not, I'm, I'm half joking, but I'm not completely joking. When you join the mailing list, a lot of the time, you will see that some person is talking to another person in a way that is really not friendly. And maybe you don't know, maybe the person being you know, insulted deserved it. Maybe, maybe they've been a really bad person for like the past six months. Maybe they've annoyed everyone. But still, when you join and you don't know if you're going to contribute, you, know, you, just, you just landed, you just subscribed, you don't know if you can actually bring your idea without being shouted at or insulted or, or, or you know, uh, treated like a stupid person. And for every person that we tolerate for being a jerk on the mailing list, because that person may have made good contributions otherwise, there are 10 people who were just listening and decided not to speak because they don't want to be insulted or don't want to be treated badly on the mailing list. And seriously, there is a behavioral problem. It's not entirely bad. I mean, most of the time people behave well, but we do get a lot of cases overall, you know, over 1,098 mailing lists. We do get a lot of cases of people behaving pretty rudely to other people and not being told off for it. And that is something that turns people away from standards. And honestly, sometimes people are jerks and sometimes it's fine to want to punch someone in the face. But if you want to punch someone in the face, don't do it on the main list. Go to their homes, you know, <laughs> knock on the door, and just like properly punch them in the face. You'll feel better for it, honestly, it feels great. I mean, it hurts a little bit afterwards, but it feels a lot better. It's better for them, and there are no bystanders to be scared of you afterwards. So, overall, people who make standards, and I'm not talking specifically about W3C or any organizations, it's the same, and you know, it's the same for what working group, the same for IETF. All of these things put together make for an, an unwilling ivory tower. It's not that people want to shut themselves up in a tower far away from, from the crowds. But all of those small problems put together mean that people who want to join and who, who are not paid professionally to do this full time have a hard time bringing their ideas. And at the end of, the, uh, of it, you get, th this is from Never Ending Story. I don't know if any of you are old enough to remember that movie, but um, it was a great movie. I cried so many times. <laughs> um, but you know, basically, you end up in a situation where you have to cross empty space to get some, some weird asteroid to climb up some ivory tower in order to speak to the people who make standards. And this is wrong. So part of that issue is also a perception of the what working group fighting with W3C. Um, you know, if you, every time I speak at conferences, people say, so, but uh, you're working on this, you know, whatever new standard, but the what working group is also working on this other thing over there. Is it a problem that you're fighting? Honestly, there are disagreements between the two organizations, but they're not that bad. They're mostly really technical, often patent-oriented or process-oriented things that no one should give a shit about, to be serious. And, um, you know, I'm, you know, if you look at the GitHub organizations for those two uh, do things, I'm an admin in both. Um, so, you know, it's not, it's not like there's war going on. Um, so I really wouldn't worry about this side of stuff. And that said, the problem that is, you know, this ivory tower thing that is keeping developers out of the process leads to app cache. This is basically the mental model that you need to have in order to use AppCache properly. 
I've been te teaching app cache in, in you know, mo mobile development workshops and things like that. And if you don't understand this entire picture, then at some point it's gonna screw you. And this is way too big a picture to understand. No one can keep that in mind at any given time. At some point, I remember at some point we had these fixing app cache meetings and we all talked and these were like, you know, very smart people in the room, people who implement browsers, people who experiment with technologies before anyone else uses them, etc. And after two hours of discussion, we realized that none of us had this picture in mind. And if technology, it's fine if technology is complicated, but is hidden away behind a nice interface or is nicely chunked into small pieces where you just use the parts that you need and you understand the parts that you need. But it's a problem when you get something that, you know, you want to use this, but you have to understand all the chain up to here and you have to know that it's going to have consequences all the way down there. That's never going to work. So that's precisely what I would like to avoid and what I think going forward we're going to be preventing. Finally, there's one problem that we can't just paste away. What I've listed previously are organizational or social problems that we can solve. The fact that standards are hard is not something that we can just magically click away. We can't just make a new community and say, hey, standards are going to be easy. Why? Because as Bruce said earlier, you have to be backwards compatible all the way to 89 to the first browsers because we still have content and that, that, that was written to the browsers from then and we need to be compatible with them. And sometimes that's very complicated and some of the parts of the web, st of the web stack are horribly complicated and very hard to understand. But that is fine. That is not something that should scare people away because if you try to participate and you don't understand some of the hard parts, people will be happy to help. We are not at the beginning of trying to solve the situation that we have where basically people who write standards are too far away from developers. There have been some early steps um, in trying to address the issue. It used to be like when when I started contributing standards as like a developer from the outside, so in the, in the late 90s basically, it used to be that the working groups were completely closed. You couldn't see their discussions. They had like a comments list that you could contribute to from the outside. Um, what they were working on, you couldn't see. It were, they, they had drafts that they used internally, but they would publish them at best every three months. And it was, it was like, you know, fairly difficult from the outside. This has gotten a lot better. Everything's public, etc. And more recently, there have been some newer steps to bring standards <coughs> closer to developers. One of them is the Test the Web Forward initiative. This is basically, um, if you go to this GitHub repo, you'll find tests, I mean, the, the current status of tests for the entire web platform. It's not as it's not anywhere near as good as it should be i mean if you've done any serious development you know how important tests are if you have any idea how complicated the web platform is you might have an idea of how many million tests uh, we need um, but currently i think i forget the number but we're somewhere around 250,000. but the idea is that if in developing something in working on something you find a problem between browsers that doesn't seem to be solved or that doesn't seem to be acknowledged, then you can make a test for it and contribute it here. And browser vendors are actually starting to use this for continuous integration. We're not completely there, but at, at least two major browser vendors are now using this as part of their continuous build system. And we're, we, they, there's work for, for, for several others. So, so the idea is that if you find a problem in, in the way web technology works, you can contribute a test there. And once your test is accepted, it's like you, the usual pull request stuff. I mean, it's GitHub, you all know how that works, right? And the idea is that this will, when it fails in a browser, it will show up a red flag in the, in the list of tests that they, that they run for, for continuous integration, and someone will get to it and fix it. So it's a much more efficient way of getting feedback back to the browser vendors 
about what doesn't work in their browsers than it is to just start finding bugs against every single browser vendor. Or at least that's the goal. It's not perfect yet, but we're getting there. But the problem is with this, it only works with existing technologies. You, know, you can't file a test against a standard that doesn't exist because you'd like a new feature. It's a great way of getting existing stuff more, inter more interoperable, but it doesn't, it doesn't allow you to create the next great API on the web. The other great thing is the extensible web manifesto. For many, many years, we created standards uh, by creating high-level features that were complicated, but that were supposed to, by themselves, solve use cases. And this worked for some things, but it doesn't work for everything. More importantly, it doesn't allow us to create new features at any kind of speed that matches the needs of developers today. It was fine for documents, it was fine for basic stuff, but when people are building applications, when people are building like really complex advanced systems on top of the web, it's not possible to wait for standards to create every single feature that people need. So the idea is that instead of trying to, um, to figure out what, you know, what the high level features need to be, we produce low level features. Like IndexedDB, for instance, is really, really painful to use if you want to use it like as a data storage, but it's great if you want to build, build a SQL store on top of it. It's great if you want to build a, you know, something like MongoDB on top of it. It's a low level storage mechanism. On top of IndexedDB, you can build something that's actually usable. And that way, the standards people don't have to figure out which of the high level uh, database systems people want to use. We just provide the way for people to build libraries that will build what people need. The problem is, even if that is a good step forward, it's definitely a huge improvement on what we had before. It's still difficult to figure out what the primitives are that people actually need. And it's very easy if you're not developing yourself and if you're not meeting with like the, you know, the hard problems yourself, like performance problems or things that work weirdly on phones and you don't know why and stuff like that, to know which of the primitives are actually needed. You know, who knows what's good? Who knows what's needed? Well, obviously the people developing the actual stuff. So that's a step forward. That's a way of making standards work better and getting better feature velocity out of them. But at this point, it's still only a manifesto and it's far from perfect. So we need to take further steps to improve on this. And finally, one of the other things that was important in bringing standards closer to developers was defining the priority of constituencies. This is part of a document called HTML Design Principles, which is a good document that I, I encourage anyone to read. And one of the most important things it says is that in designing anything, you should consider users over authors, because if the user needs something, it's more important than the web developer. Authors over implementers, because web developers matter more than the people building browsers. It should be easier on developers than on browser vendors. Browser vendors over specifiers, like people like, like me, because it should be easy, easier on the people who build browsers than it is on the people who actually have to write the specification documents. And specifiers over tech theoretical purity, because none of us have actually done comp sci and we don't give a fuck about that kind of shit. Um, <laughs> but seriously, <coughs> this is an important step. The problem is, when you're a guy over here, how do you know what these guys want? Well, you kind of use it yourself, but are you a typical user? Yeah, not really. You can kind of, well, I mean, we talk a lot with these guys because they tend to participate in groups and these tend to be the same people a lot of the time. But still, it's not the same thing. And, you know, I'm not an implementer. I'm, I'm a web developer initially, so I'm, I'm sort of like this. But even then, you know, I started here, I started working there, and the thing is, even though I still do web development, I, I understand this part too much to be a proper, you know, like the representative web developer. I'm, you know, if I want a feature in, I know how the mailing list works, I know how the working groups work, I know who to talk to, etc. 
So uh, getting developers more involved is really important. Oh, obviously, ideally, we'd get users involved, but <laughs> yeah, no one knows how that works. I mean, those fuckers are completely stupid. But, uh, <laughs> but we're, 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 we over here are hoping that you guys over there would get to deal with those stupid people over there, right? Because you're looking at the no, but seriously, it, it, developers matter because they understand technology and are in direct contact with the people who ask stupid things on websites. Um, and that, that's, that actually matters a lot because a lot of the stuff you have to do may not be entirely sensible in the first place, but it's stuff you have to do and it needs to be done well and, and hopefully intelligently, etc. And that's uh, our job to, to, to make possible. So where do we go from here? Those are the, you know, I stated the problems, I stated a few steps that were taken so far. Now we need to crowd synergize. What? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Bruce. Um, we'll get you banana. Look, this is a mirror. Uh, hang on. Oh, okay. I, it doesn't work. But um, anyway, the, the important next step is, is really, and I mean this very seriously, to make developing open standards as easy as developing open source projects. The idea is that, you know, I mean, I don't know about you, but when I find a problem with a library I'm using, I, you know, check out the, the I clone the, the, the repo on GitHub, I look at this uh, as a source, if I can find the problem quickly enough and it's not too horrible, I make a patch and I, I submit a pull request. And standards should be the same way. If you find something that doesn't work well in web technology, like there's an attribute missing that should be obvious, or there's a value missing in this, or you need a new element or something like that, it should be the same thing. Obviously, it can't be as fast, because you can't have someone accept your pull request and bam, it's implemented in every single browser. But you could at least you know, sh propose the, the, the new feature and push it forward to make it implemented. The first step in that is what we call discourse. I, I, any of you familiar with the discourse system? Yeah, Bruce is, yeah, two people, great, three, wonderful. Um, if you've used a, a, a web forum before, you probably want to claw your eyes out from, from it, and you probably you like want to throw, jump out the window at the very mention of it. Discourse is not like that. Discourse is a new forum system that's actually very nice to use. Um, you can have civilized discussions in it like, that are threaded, that have, you know, they, they, it's, resp it, it, it's fast, it's, it's nice. And we use this for um, web standards discussion. Um, it's, it's an experiment as of last year. It has a community of a few, a few hundred people. And basically the idea is that instead of trying to figure out where to bring your idea, if you want something new in web technology, you know, instead of trying to figure out of those thousand mailing lists, where to post it? Just go there, you know. Sign up. Um, if you have an account on any of like Google, Facebook, Twitter, GitHub, whatever, you can you can just use that, or you can create one. It's just like it's the stupidest, simplest sign up procedure that you can find, and then start writing and asking questions. Um, it's not meant to be a support forum. It's not a, you know. It's not a replacement for Stack Overflow. It's a place where you can suggest new features uh, for web technology, like core web technology that goes into browsers. And it's a place to ask about or mention problems that you have with existing um, technology. And it works. I mean, it, this has not been running a year yet. And already several of those threads have made their ways into standards. And some of those are already implemented in browsers. So in terms of feature velocity, there's no one who can tell you that they actually wrote to a standards organization and got the feature implemented in under a year. That has never happened. This is like, you know, really fast. And I'm not saying that every single of those threads has gotten implemented, no. Um, you know, some of them might go somewhere, some of them will go nowhere, but, you know, some of them have succeeded. And this is not at all like W2C only. If you look at the tags here, if you go on the site, um, you can see that there's uh, ASMJS discussions. Uh, some some of the people in T39 who develop JavaScript are also using this. 
uh, it's open to IETF, what working group, W3C, et cetera. The, the idea is that anything to do with standards, web standards, um, you can discuss here. And it will, at some point, if there's some interest, if the conversation is going good, make its way into, into a standard. There's also this very new project called Web Specs. And this is like completely, completely <coughs> brand new. It's, it works. We have three drafts published on it. Uh, but it's, it, it's sort of flimsy, but it's getting better. And the idea here is that if you have, you know, if, if you want to take a step further beyond just discussing problems or new ideas, and if you want to propose a new feature to the web platform as a future web standard, then you can use this on specs.webplatform.org um, in order to push new ideas, new technology, new features to the platform. And basically, so you can already visit it, it, it exists. And the idea is that it's meant to be as simple as open source is on GitHub. So you write your specifications on GitHub in a simple um, document. They get automatically published on the specs.webplatform.org website with just, you know, you just need to register your specification on something. And people can compare them and go, hey, I really like this feature. I would like that to go into HTML. This makes sense for CSS, et cetera, et cetera. So the idea is to make it really simple and really easy as you know, any kind of forking situation. If you find a specification that's being written under the system and you want a big change in it, you can just fork it and make the changes and publish it. And we don't mind that there are two specifications on the same space. The idea is that that's the point. That's, you know, you can have them one next to the other and discuss the advantages of, of either side. So it's a slightly more removed from open source, but you can get uh, your ideas for future standards, future things that go into browsers um, uh, discussed online. It's built on a few uh, basic principles. A, specifications should be hackable. Today, specs, as they are delivered to people, are not hackable. If you take the HTML5 specification, it's like dozens of pages of something for which um, it depends. For the What Working Group version, you can't even have the tools that generate it. They're like closed source. They, they are not available. If it's for the WPC version, there's a bunch of Python scripts that are absolutely horrible to use. And I know because I kind of hacked a bunch of them together. And if you can make your way through the 120,000 lines of HTML and weird undocumented syntax that it uses, then you might be able to propose something. But today, it's really hard for people who just want to propose one feature for the web platform to do so. On web specs, that's not the case. Everything is, well, it's not perfectly documented yet, but the, the, all the tools are out there, open source, documented, etc. Everything is forkable. So today, if you take a W3C standard, bizarrely enough, even though it's called an open standard, you're not allowed to copy it because the copyright is kept from you. Um, you're on web specs, all everything is, is forkable. You can, you know, as in any open source project, just duplicate it, make your own version. Obviously, the idea is not to have like 20 competing standards. The idea is that people use this to make variants that then get merged together. Thoughtful is the principle of not being a jerk. Um, we came up with the term thoughtful because we were in a long Twitter discussion about wouldn't it be nice if our community had this idea of you know not being a jerk? But that sounds negative. You know, it's like, hey, you're a non-jerk. Congratulations. And we, we thought about a bunch of other things like nice people or you know, cuddly people or whatever. And you know, if you're not Bruce and I, uh, you might not want to cuddle random people. And like, yeah, yeah, well, I know, I know you're fine with that, and I'm fine with that. But not everyone is completely con con comfortable with that. So, but the idea is that thoughtful people is like people who think about other people and how they might react to what they write, and that basically makes you a non-jerk to start with. Royalty-free, basically, yeah. If you use the technology, you shouldn't have to pay money for it. That's fair enough. 
Software practices. This might surprise you, but the way in which standards are developed today are still very far away from any notion. And you know, even if you're not into like agile, or whatever, or whatever the latest thing is in software development, you would still find that way standards are developed like completely crazy. Like that, a lot of these things. A lot of the, the standards like take years to finish and you don't know if they're good before they finish. There's no like continuous testing of whether they're good. Um, and the idea here is that basically we evaluate, I mean, anything that's proposed, either it's like a crazy proposal and that's like a topic branch, or it's something that's serious and it has tests. And we require every standards that every spec that eventually wants to become serious, uh, you know, when, when it's, it, it becomes, when it moves towards standardization to, to support testing. We have a very serious anti-jerk policy. I know I've said this at least five times before, but we really, really mean this. Um, I am pretty much a recovering jerk myself. I've been a jerk to a lot of people on a lot of main lists. In, in really harsh ways. And today, I reserve that to the people who are being jerks. So the only case in which you're allowed to punch someone in the face on the mailing list is if they've been really, really nasty and they've had like five chances to become nice, then the people who, who have been jerks for 20 years will be allowed to turn on that person. And that never ends well for that person. So really, honestly, this is a strong anti-joke policy. It's not just that we will we'll wag our fingers at you if you misbehave and if you're a bad person. We will crush you. <laughs> so there's documentation on the project. It's relatively lightweight, but it's changing every day. I change it on the train here, and it's moving forward. Um, so you're more than welcome to just like follow this link, read about it, start proposing stuff, start joining in. You will find problems. Uh, you will hit upon the kind of bugs that you have in a, in a product that's one month old, uh, because this is like all completely new. But um, we will fix those bugs, and we will make things work for you. Um, if you're if you're interested, there's a small community that's building up on IRC and and Twitter, etc. So, you know. You can also help the project. Most of it is written in JavaScript. There's just one component that's written in Python, but we'll get rid of it. Um, but it's, it's, it's all on GitHub. So even if you're not, you know, if you don't want to write a specification, but you think that it's important that developers should be able to contribute to the creation of future web technology, then you can go here and help build the stuff. Um, some of it is good code, some of it is crap code. It's all being improved progressively and iteratively, so uh, it's very open to, to contributions. And one of the important things, and this is to return to the extensible web uh, theme that, that came up earlier, is that it's really important to experiment. If you, want, if you have a new feature that you want to bring forward, you don't need to write a perfect specification for it. Um, a lot of people will, will uh, it depends. Some people will say, only talk to us once you've specified it, and that's silly. Other people will say, don't ever specify it, don't ever specify it, don't ever specify it, just, I hope we can cut this, don't ever <laughs> specify it, we will bring, you know, just bring us your use cases and we will do everything. And that's silly too. I mean, you can't centralize everything on a few people who just take the use cases. We, you know, successful communities, build new contributors. Like Wikipedia has been really good at training new people who write articles. And when they make mistakes, they don't get shot at that. They get like corrections and people explain why it's a mistake, etc. And you draw people in by being nice. And the idea here is that we want to welcome experiments. So write a shitty spec. It's fine if it's shitty. It, it won't kill anyone. It won't break anything. No one will scream at you, but you will start proposing something based on that. And people will you know, make pull requests and improve it. And as part of the extensible web platform, you can also start building using the existing primitives. So there's a good example here by my good friend Steve Faulkner of the sarcasm element. And this is an example of how to build a new element 
you know, if you wanted to suggest the sarcasm element as part of HTML5, that might be justified. Some of you might say, hey, you can build it as a, as, as a web component, you don't need to, and that might be a good response in this case. But in other cases, some elements cannot be easily built using web components, and so you could demonstrate that, hey, you know, I've written this code that implements this new element, and this is how it will be, and these are the problems that I'm seeing, and this is why my spec for this new element needs to be implemented. It makes sense. So I encourage you to look at this, and you know, if you want to propose a new element, start from that. Experiment, I mean, that's the whole spirit of, of the extensible web, is that developers can build things, and some of those things will just stand on their own. They can just be used by other people, reused by libraries, or just used by one person. But some of them can be demonstrated as the future technology that needs to make it into the stack, that needs to be solidified. And that goes through also writing a specification for them. So far, I've spoken about things that exist. This slide about is about something that does not exist. Uh, it's called Chapters. It's an ongoing project that I hope um, a few of us, and this is not belonging, belonging to any organization, but then I hope that a few of us are going to ship this year. Um, there's a site called chapters.io, and it's not linked because it doesn't exist, but it's being worked on in um, this repository, uh, well, this organization. And the idea is that you know, people have uh, technical meetings about pretty much everything. I mean, like this one about HTML5, and there are others about JavaScript, Python, Ruby, Perl, etc. But there are no um, meetings about standards and web standards in particular. And the idea is to start a worldwide um, loose organization of meetings about web standards. And they don't have to be dedicated only to web standards. Uh, I mean, it, it may be like NLHTML5 will be like the Amsterdam chapter or like, you know, something like that. It doesn't matter. But the idea is to have this very simple website where people can organize their own meetings to talk about web standards and get together and use the web specs platform and use web platform tests, et cetera, et cetera, in order to contribute to the platform. So it's, it's just basically a very simple, very basic thing where you can, you can get started um, with meetings for, for web standards. And with this, you can see this is one of the first web standards meetings with sausages. <laughs> um, you can, we can all look great like that, and I love the little hats and everything. It's just like, it's just like perfect. So, you know, seriously, you know, come join us. It's fun. Um, you know, look at us. I mean, have you ever seen anyone sexier than Bruce or I? That's what Web Standards does for you. So thank you very much for your attention, and any questions are welcome. Two questions, really. Would it be fair to say that what you're proposing W3C does in and affiliated groups in relation to the Extensible Web Manifesto could be characterized as almost bringing the best of web culture, like collaboration, GitHub, etc., to the manufacturer of the web itself? Yes. Thanks. Because <laughs> <laughs> I just thought of that, and I thought it might be a nice slide. Yeah, I wish I'd said it as well during my talk, yeah. You will. <laughs> Second question. Um, you mentioned that some of the ideas on specification, the discourse blog, had already made it into standards. Can you give us some examples? Um, sure. Well, the, uh, the, there is one very basic and sad example, which is the Becker Purple um, keyword that made it, made it into CSS. Uh, but there's also been work started on um, the um, application manifest based on discussions there. So the idea that you could have a manifest attached to a web page that could have load you know, all sorts of metadata. Um, there's been work on media APIs based on discussion there. Um, currently the HTML media element API, you know, that allows you to control video and audio and stuff like that. Um, is far from complete, and people would like to see uh, you know, a, a bunch of other things. And those are being discussed. They're not 
finished yet, but uh, they're being discussed. And yeah, there's a, there's a number of other things. Um, the other one that comes to mind is um, what's it called? It's responsive viewports, or oh, I forget. Um, oh, um, element queries. Yeah, element queries exactly. So uh, the the element queries is something that's been discussed many times, but the discussion on on the discourse platform actually triggered uh, new work in that area that basically allows you to resize elements based on other elements in the DOM instead of just the viewport or things like that, um, which is pretty powerful. A good way of shooting yourself in the foot if it's not done right, because you could get into all sorts of ending loops and things like that. It's, it's hard technology, but the, the use cases and the discussion happen there. And there's a bunch of others. I mean, I'm not very familiar with ASMJS, um, but they seem to have most, I mean, the actual group that's working on that seems to have most of its discussion on, on this course. Um, it, it's a platform that runs it itself well enough as a community that I, as the administrator, don't even need to know what's going on most of the time. Um, so yeah, a, a bunch of things have, have already made their way into standards, and we'd certainly be happy for more of that to happen. Uh, the limitation of this course, and that's why Web Specs was created, is that we had several threads where everyone went, yay, that's a great idea. Now, where do we go to specify it? And you know, if there's no group for that, or the group for that is like too political or complicated. You can't tell people to, to, to go there. So web specs is like the next step. The idea is that if you have an idea, you discuss it on this course. If a bunch of, you know, it doesn't have to be like 200 other people. If like three other people will say, hey, that's an interesting idea. Let's talk about this. Then you can use web specs to just like start hashing out ideas on this and then hopefully get them into browsers eventually. Any other questions? Don't be shy. I mean, I, I, as I said, I used to be a jerk, but I try to be really nice now. <laughs> Thank you. Good excellent. It's yes. Yeah. Nobody had any questions. We're that good. Yes, I know. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if you're shy, we can talk over the air as well. Yeah. Uh, Robin's got an early train tomorrow, so we're planning to drink through the night. So if anybody wants to join us. <laughs> Thank you very much, anyway, and th thanks a lot. For